Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As a short introduction, I'm Jessica Chia, Managing Director of Eco Business, and I'm delighted to be your moderator. I'd like to first thank the World Economic Forum for the invitation to moderate this panel, which touches on an important topic that has been significantly undervalued. It's wonder to, wonderful to see nature-based solutions being put on the agenda for one of the first sessions to kick off the Sustainable Development Impact Summit held alongside the United Nations General Assembly this week. This discussion today cannot be more timely. We are reaching irreversible tipping points for nature and the climate. The World Economic Forum report, Nature Risk Rising, found that over half of the global GDP, some 44 trillion US dollars, is threatened by nature loss as a result of the dependence on business on nature. And to quote one of my favorite documentaries, Our Planet, Our Business, there are no jobs on a dead planet. COVID-19 has exposed the critical link between human and planetary health. The exploitation of our natural world, including deforestation, has created multiple significant challenges for society, not to mention the increasing frequency of pandemics as we have seen. But this global crisis now presents us with a once in a lifetime opportunity to reset the way we do things and to get it right. We need to integrate nature-based solutions into the recovery plans of governments and businesses worldwide. The safeguarding of natural ecosystems is crucial if we are to meet both diversity, biodiversity and climate goals, and also to future-proof our businesses and our economies. So today we will speak to some of the leading voices from the public, private and civil society from around the world that are using nature-based solutions to help pave the way to a nature positive future, one that is also sustainable and resilient. And I'd now like to introduce our distinguished speakers. They are His Excellency, Mr. Malik Amin Aslam, Federal Minister for Climate Change and Advisor to the Prime Minister, Pakistan, Ms. Virginia Helias, Chief Sustainability Officer at PNG, Ms. Wanjuhi Goroje, Founder of People Planet Africa, Ms. Zoe Knight, Group Head, HSBC Center of Sustainable Finance, Managing Director at HSBC Holdings. Mr. Stephen Lloyd, Lead Sustainable Investment Advisory of Arab Group. And Mr. Minister Ricardo Lozano, Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development at Colombia. A huge welcome to you speakers and thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping guidelines. This session is being live streamed on the World Economic Forum website. It will last for an hour and we will start with the panel. Following that, audience members will have the opportunity to ask questions. Please use the hand raise function if you'd like to ask a question. And we would also ask that you turn on your video when you ask the question and be sure to mute yourself when you're done speaking. We also kindly ask that you change your Zoom name to your full name and organization so we can call on you to ask your questions. I'd also like to everyone to contribute to a lively discussion here today by engaging with the topic and sharing your thoughts in the chat box. Following the session, we will have a 15 minute optional networking where you can stay on to speak to other participants and also learn more about the various initiatives. So please stay on if you're interested in this rapid fire networking. We have a lot to get through. So I'm going to start with our first speaker today, Minister Amin. I'd like to ask you, you know, how do nature-based solutions play a role in Pakistan's green stimulus plan and the government of Pakistan's efforts to conserve and restore the country's forests? And how can the international community and businesses support these efforts? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much, Jessica, and uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to this forum. Uh, as we all collectively go through this uh, huge catastrophe that the world is facing, I think nature has taught us two very important lessons. One of them is a stark warning, and the other one is an opportunity. Uh, the stark warning that nature has given to all of the world is that there are boundaries and nature works within certain limits and certain balances. And if we try to tilt that balance, nature will strike back. And we've seen what happens when nature strikes back, because we're all in the middle of a zoonotic uh, pandemic, uh, which happened when humans, you know, invaded the uh, territory of animals. Uh, on the other hand, nature is also providing us with a window of opportunity. And the opportunity is that we don't have to uh, come, out, come out of this pandemic on the same pathway that got us in there. We can have a different world. And we have seen the different world during this pandemic also. 
we have seen when humans have retreated what has happened we've seen the blue skies uh, the clean air uh, that we've all uh, breathed and we've seen you know when we try to rebalance the this uh, existence with nature uh, there is a positivity attached to it uh, you asked about pakistan pakistan uh, you know learned about this uh, about four years back when we started our billion tree project in one of the small provinces of pakistan we learned that when you start investing in nature nature always pays you back during that four year period uh, we planted more than a billion trees but what we did not uh, factor in were the half million jobs that were created the youth the rural women and the community that got engaged and created a, this this new economy in that whole province which which was based on the realization the realization of of saving trees and investing in nature uh, on but based on that realization we were already on a pathway which was looking at uh, nature based solutions uh, but what happened that during the covid era it, it, you know when we all took a step back uh, from from the from the rat races that we were all in uh, we realized that uh, yes uh, you know there is a, a new pathway to be taken out uh, for the development of the country also and our prime minister imran khan uh, he tasked me to work on what is called a green stimulus and we then announced that green stimulus Uh, which was based on two main objectives the first one was that we have to protect nature so nature protection was the first part of that green stimulus and the second part was creating green jobs uh, as you rightly said there are no jobs on a dead planet uh, so we 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 really uh, looked into that issue and we thought that yes you know and the pandemic was giving us this huge uh, crisis of people uh, moving away from cities to uh, back to rural areas without jobs and employment so all of this because of the lockdown uh, so we 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 try to bring the two together that if we could protect nature and if we could also create jobs then that would create a real sustainable stimulus for us as a country and so we when we thought about what we could do in that time we had three uh, main objectives that we uh, clearly laid out the first one was uh, that uh, as i said the billion tree project we were already working on that in the province but now we were working on a 10 billion tree project for the whole country uh, which included seven different plans for the seven different ecological areas of pakistan uh, we gave it a, a, a trigger for for jobs and we created 84000 jobs during this pandemic period for people who were out in the open in rural areas they could work in covid safe environments have a mask do social distancing still plant trees still plant the nurseries still be out there in the forest preventing the forest fires and getting an employment also so this was a really productive way that we could engage with the people uh, and also protect nature so the 10 billion tree tsunami was the first part the other second part of this in pakistan we had about 30 parks uh, which were more or less you know notified parks but they were really paper parks because nothing happened in those in terms of protection but what we did was we tr we through this protected area initiative which was announced uh, during this period we enhanced the number of parks by 25% so we went from 30 to 40 national parks these 10 new national parks uh, which is about uh, which got protected was announced during the covid era uh, we also announced along with it the pakistan's first national park service uh, to be put in place which would employ 5000 youth to become the guardians of nature uh, to you know promote eco tourism and still so we are protecting nature again uh, creating the jobs on the ground this was also done in the covid time period uh, and the third part of it was to look at urban areas and the solid waste management issues that we have over there and what we call the clean green initiative in, in 20 cities of pakistan so again they were looking at the gaps in the solid and the liquid waste management systems uh, to put those in place and and again try to create the jobs uh, that the young people could in, uh, get, get employed in during this period so all three of these elements were as i said protecting nature but at the same time creating the jobs and we found that you know this was a real uh, 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 remarkable thing that happened i have read the reports uh, you know the world economic forum saying that for every dollar that you invest, invest in nature uh, you get 9 dollars back and i think during our experiences that that is absolutely true uh, if not conservative uh, the nature payback is 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 much more than you can actually anticipate and that was really remarkable 
uh, I just wanted to also uh, mark out the area of financing that we took this initiative. Uh, where did the money come from? Uh, uh, you know, I, on that issue, when we when we started working on it, we were not really thinking about the money, uh, but we had a plan, and the plan was that we will tap three different resources. The first one was obviously our own funding, which was coming out of our, out of our budget, which was allocated. We increased that for this COVID period uh, because we had created a COVID fund also, which was looking at jobs. So we used that fund for 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 these initiatives, uh, and we continue to do that. But the second part was that we had created a platform called the Ecosystem Restoration Fund. That platform was created, it was announced in the Madrid COP meeting, and we had created it not knowing that COVID is coming, but we had created it with the idea that if we have a clear green plan for development, there will be partners who will want to come on board that plan. So they could take a part of that plan or you know uh, part of these initiatives and we could provide them with quantifiable progress on the ground. So that fund was already, already in place and during the COVID era, we were, uh, uh, you know, uh, very fortunate that we we managed to get about, about you know, one eighty million dollars of World Bank funding. Uh, this was the first World Bank, or probably the only World Bank funding in the world, which got repurposed for nature protection, and we managed to get that for this ecosystem restoration fund. Uh, the third part of our plan, which we had laid out, and we had, didn't have an idea that this is, might also happen, was that uh, we were looking at debt for nature swaps. So. Uh, Pakistan is a country which is, uh, you know, heavily indebted, and we have also called out for, you know, uh, uh, nations to uh, uh, ease that debt in, because of the COVID crisis. But what we were saying also was that if we could bring this debt down with uh, with certain partners, and at the same time provide them with, uh, you know, clearly quantifiable biodiversity indicators that we were meet, meeting in Pakistan, they may be takers for that sort of an instrument. And luckily, you know, as we went through the COVID era. We now are one of the uh, we are, are being considered as a pilot country for a, what is called a nature bond, which is similar to a debt for nature swap. So it's basically looking at uh, matching us up with debtor countries who are would be interested in countries who can show quantifiable progress for biodiversity protection and nature protection. So we are already in that process. It's a very exciting process because it's a new instrument which is being developed. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to say that we're in it. So what I really wanted to say was that if you are willing to put your trust in nature, if you uh, if you have a plan on ground, the money always gets available. You know, it's not the it's not the main issue. Uh, so I think that uh, that's uh, what I wanted to share uh, with the economic forum. And I think that our experience has been extremely positive. We are doing what is good for Pakistan, what is good for the world, and what is good for people and nature all in one. It's a win-win strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. I think it's super encouraging to see your efforts in that area and also the financing tools that are available to government now, governments today. So I think we'll come back to some of those points. Um, I would now like to go to uh, Virginie from PNG. Uh, PNG recently you know, made its carbon neutrality commitments. How are you using P uh, nature-based solutions to meet these commitments? And can you maybe share with us what are some of your top learnings and barriers that PNG has experienced in designing and implementing these solutions? So um, we have actually a two-pronged strategy uh, to, to meet this commitment to be carbon neutral for the decade. I mean, first, um, a science-based target uh, of 50% absolute reduction in our scope one and two. Uh, and we will do that by increasing energy efficiency, by purchasing 100% renewable electricity globally, and then balancing the emissions that, that we cannot eliminate uh, by advancing a portfolio of natural-based solution. And that will deliver um, carbon benefits that are equal to our remaining emission. We estimate about 30 million uh, metric tons over the, the next decade. So in terms of the learning, it's, it's relatively early days for us, but I, I can capture the top learnings are as follows. I mean, the first one is really trust the experts, you know, the, the experts who will tell you where the carbon is, you know, because it's not about uh, what we want to protect. It, it, it's about what uh, the planet needs. And so this is why we work with experts like Conservation International uh, and uh, WWF to really curate uh, our programs in the best way possible. The second learning I would say is about um, seeking to maximize 
both the environmental and the social co-benefits. You know, it's, it's very important to take into account local communities, you know, to, to ensure that they are engaged, that they are supportive and that uh, they will benefit from the program. Um, and, and this is what we do in the planning of our programs. You know, we, we use a participatory design approach where all stakeholders are, are taken into account. The third learning would be um, really to consider the whole spectrum of, you know, protection, land management, uh, improvement and, and restoration versus, you know, only uh, planting trees. You know, protection and improvement land management can, can actually drive a very meaningful carbon benefit. So, for instance, we have a, a program in, in, uh, in the Philippines, the Palawan mangroves uh, with Conservation International, and that is about protection. But our Atlantic Forest project uh, that we run in Brazil with WWF um, is, a, is a restoration project. And I would say the fourth learning, uh, and it's particularly relevant for consumer goods company like us, I mean, we touch 5 billion consumers every day through our brands, is the opportunity to uh, engage people, you know, citizens, to, to turn them into, um, I would say, conservation champions, you know. Uh, making them more aware of the role they can play, you know, in responsible consumption. And, and we are running uh, several consumer facing programs you know, to engage consumers. So like Pampers Seeds of Love, you know, for every tree, for every pack that people purchase of Pampers, you know, we, we plant a tree or, or we have a program in Russia, you know, for the protect the, the forest of Russia uh, for every purchase of a PNG product, you know, we donate to WWF. Uh, to protect the, the, the forests that are devastated by uh, uh, human-caused fires. Um, so that, those will be uh, the, the top learning so far. As I said, it, it's, it's early days. And, and, and in terms of the barriers, you know, I would, I would say that, um, you know, nature-based solution is an emerging play, uh, space uh, and uh, we are all learning together. But what, what I personally see is that everyone understands the value that nature brings and the role it can play in, in addressing climate change. Um, but uh, the issue is that we don't have a globally acknowledged framework you know, to, to move from uh, concept to execution, especially at, at the scale uh, and speed that is needed. So, so for me, the first obstacle is that there is no clear uh, framework parameters, you know, that, that define natural climate solution, including how you account for, for the carbon benefits. And there has been some work, you know, to define natural-based solution in general, but, but there is no widely agreed uh, definition and criteria. So, so developing international standards like the, the ISO uh, for natural-based solution and, and on international um, recognize you know certification system would be would be of, of great value and this is why um, PNG is working closely with, with expert organization uh, we are creating an advisory board you know we to understand how to um, not only best design and implement natural based solution but also how to define the metrics you know to to effectively uh, and accurately uh, measure and, and track our efforts so and last you know the the collateral of this absence of clear definition uh, is, is a lack of financing. You know, most estimates suggest that natural-based solutions only attract two to three percent you know, of public climate finance globally. So, it's very low. It's very low compared to the need and, and the potential. So, a clear framework may help reorient capital flows and, and uh, de-risking investment in natural-based solutions for the capital market. But as we've heard, you know, from, from minister. When you invest in nature, nature pays you back, you know, one to, one to nine. Uh, so in the end, uh, it is a very smart business. So I'm hopeful that things will, will develop in, in the right way to, uh, to accelerate efforts, you know, at, at, uh, at the scale we need. Thank you so much, Virginie. And I think that some encouraging trends towards global standards are happening right now. You know, you've really hit the, the nail on the head with um, the need for a common framework. And I think IUCN had earlier this year launched a, a global framework for nature-based solutions. So hopefully we can see the industry coming together. Um, I'd like now to turn to Wanjuhi, who's going to share with us some interesting stories from Africa. Can you tell us a little bit about your greatest success and challenges in your work to restore Kenya's forest cover? And perhaps also, if you can, your top three recommendations for projects working with nature-based solutions at the community level. Over to you. 
Thank you very much. Um, for me, I would say that um, my greatest success this far has been working with the rural communities, especially those that uh, the people living around forest. When I ran uh, the Save Our Forest KE campaign, which was very, very successful and led to a ban on forest uh, timber harvesting uh, in natural, in, in, in uh, national and community uh, forests. Um, at the time, I would say I lived in a bubble because I wanted to see uh, forest harvesting completely abolished in Kenya. Um, but that wasn't realistic because there are people who rely solely on, um, on this forest as a source of livelihood. So when you say stop cutting down trees, what other alternative are you giving them? It was a journey of humility and understanding that climate action without the people was useless. It was it, it is going out to go around in circles. We've had um, restoration projects where we where the community has grazed uh, their sheep and cattle on our trees, the trees that we've planted. But when you work together with them, when you create awareness, um, you, you see it's the, the, and, and we love working with, with, schools, uh, with school children, um, particularly those in primary schools, although we work with high schools and universities as well, but those in primary schools are, are like um, sponges that absorb. So you will go for a tree planting exercise and you tell the, the kids who've planted the trees that these trees are your sole responsibility. And, and I remember in one school that didn't have a fence, um, the students went back home and told the parents, you cannot graze your sheep or cattle on our trees because my trees have to survive. And so working with rural communities for me has been the, 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 the greatest success. It's been a beautiful experience because at times you're going to communities and you find that these communities do not even appreciate um, the benefits of forest, other benefits of forest other than wood benefits. But when you expose them to benefits such as beekeeping, when you expose them to things like bamboo, they realize that oh my goodness there is something else that we can do from with this forest without destroying um, their natural states as well so um, my lowest moment has obviously been uh, weak policies that some have been formulated um, with loopholes that allow for the brutal mutilation of forests the second one will be the insatiable human greed uh, because at times we deliberately um, and, and this happens to be with the leaders. They will deliberately pass laws that have loopholes so that they can continue mutilating our forests. Um, one of the forests is called Mao Forest. Um, in, in the early 90s, we had an act passed that allowed indigenous communities to continue living in the forests. Unfortunately, that was used um, uh, by people, people who are not even indigenous communities sold their land and went to live in the forest. And the damage, and this is one of the biggest water towers in Kenya, the damage on that forest is painful. Um, my three recommendations would be, I have learned that there is nothing for us without us. So if we are going to do projects, restoration projects in the rural areas, in the community level, we have to involve the community. The first recommendation will be creation of awareness. Most of the people who uh, mutilate the forest unfortunately do not understand uh, climate change and the severe effects of climate change. Some of them do not even, uh, as I said earlier, understand that there are other benefits that they could derive from this forest. And thirdly, there is also so much to learn from these communities. So when you go to the community and, and you interact with them, first you expose them to, um, to another world of other benefits such as beekeeping, which is highly profitable, um, to other benefits like seedlings, um, uh, to other benefits such as um, bamboo, plantations which whose regeneration is amazing and has uh, countless benefits as well. Um, I would say the next uh, recommendation would be economic empowerment. Improvement of livelihoods um, and restoration are intertwined. I remember when, again, in 2018, when all this started and we were running the Save Our Forest KE campaign following the brutal mutilation of forests in Kenya. Um, at the time, we wanted to kick out people, to have people kicked out of forests. but um, the government has a project called the Shamba system. Shamba is Swahili for uh, farm. Um, and so when we have plantations where government allows people to harvest as a way of raising capital and also meeting the growing demand for timber. So when uh, a section is, is, is harvested, the community is allowed to go back in and, and plant the trees as well as have a bit of agroforestry for the first five years. 
Um, initially, we were opposed to the project uh, because we thought this was a loophole that many people are using to mutilate the forest. But today we appreciate that well, when it's done well, the community benefits from uh, agroforestry. They benefit from uh, farming, uh, farm produce on the, on the forest, as well as taking care of the, for of the trees until they are at a point where they can grow on their own. Um, secondly, um, I would say that um, the third, ben the, the third recommendation I would give is um, policy formulation. Um, in Africa, and I stand corrected, for a very long time, Kenya was the only country with the Climate Change Act, which was passed in 2016. And fortunately, the said act is not active because it still has, uh, it, it's yet to, to be implemented. Um, Africa Union, which ought to be the organ that gives guidance to the rest of Africa, their Climate Change Act is still in its draft form since 2017. And this is a case across many countries in the global south. Some it's because they do not know how, it, it, climate change is complex and they do not know how to navigate. Others because they're not simply willing to do it. They want to continue with the laws that have loopholes so that they can continue mutilating the forest. And unless we have very, very strong policies in place, um, I doubt anything that we do today is of any use because somebody else will still take advantage of the law and the loopholes that exist to go ahead and mutilate the forest. So my three recommendations are creation of awareness, um, improvement of livelihoods, incorporating improvement of livelihoods into um, the restoration projects, um, and thirdly, formulation or change of policies. We need strong policies in place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wanjuhi. Many important lessons learned for us there, especially where it comes to policy formulation. I really hope that, uh, you know, us having this conversation will actually help to bring those issues to light and we're actually going to see improvements in legislation. Um, I'm going to come to Stephen now. Stephen, you're from Arup Group, which is, you know, a huge infrastructure-based um, uh, uh, urban planner. How can nature-based solutions help to make infrastructure more sustainable? And can you also share with us what, in your experience, has been the biggest barriers to the integration of nature positive design in our built environment? Thanks, Jessica. Um, so there are many uh, ways nature-based solutions can make infrastructure more sustainable. Um, I'm really gonna focus on three example areas. Uh, first, natural solutions can improve infrastructure service provision and can really enhance the resilience to climate change. So combining natural system, systems such as forests and floodplains with traditional grain infrastructures such as treatment systems and tunnels can enhance both climate mitigation and resilience adaptation. So for example, uh, forest landscapes restoration and regreening of city spaces has a huge impact on uh, carbon sequ uh, sequestration. Um, what this means is that um, land use management is now a critical opportunity area for major landowners uh, such as utilities using upstream catchments and restoration of natural water courses to manage floodwaters um, can provide, um, really provide effective, effective responses. Um, these natural appro approaches can also help us move towards biodiversity net gain. Um, so net gains where we restore the natural ecosystem to enable the recovery, but also the creation of new habitats. Um, so in the UK, we're building um, coastal levees and barriers to use natural vegetation and natural realignment We've managed to retreat and that's creating new biodiversity and new habitats. Um, so se second benefits is um, despite the common view that natural solutions are more expensive, actually there's lots of examples to prove they can be more cost effective. Um, so implementation of blue green solutions in New York and post hurricane Sandy um, significantly reduced the capital costs compared to traditional grey solutions and we've repeated this in Shanghai. Um, where we're using green and blue solutions to hugely reduce the size of drainage interceptor tunnels, which is uh, solving the massive surface flooding issue across the city. I think a third opportunity area is around, um, as just, just, we just heard from Kenya and from Pakistan, is around the response to societal challenges. So engaging communities in developing natural solutions to infrastructure creates real opportunities for economic and social development and creates better places to live. Um, so I think of an example of that, um, watershed protection can create income opportunities for local communities through restoration of soil quality or improved food security. And natural solutions can also create opportunities for community action and ownership and implementation of these ideas. So maintaining bioswales or green spaces within cities. Um, but also natural solutions play a large role in improving health and mental well-being. 
I think the mental the uh, well-being thing is, is often overlooked but um, so examples of improving the air quality creating more livable spaces and providing immunity assets are really important areas so if I now have to sort of look across to the challenges um, there are many challenges to adopting natural solutions and some of these are real or physical and some are more perceived or about attitudes um, I think the starting point with um, thinking about nature solutions is, is actually the, the underlying complexity of, of biodiversity. Nature-based systems of themselves are, are complex and, and need local-based solutions, not generic responses. So you can't just have a cookie cutter approach. It has to be really bespoke. And, and natural systems don't respect organizational structures and boundaries. So there's often a, a siloed mentality across uh, key stakeholders and across systems. So if we're gonna to respond to this, we need to operate better across the, uh, these integrated natural systems and develop solutions at the appropriate scale uh, that cut across uh, the governance and organizational barriers. Um, I think the second challenge is uh, the lack of awareness. We've just been hearing that from others and resistance to change. And this creates challenges and hurdles at, at every stage of the value chain or, or, or through the project life cycle. Um, so this means that even when you do create an innovative solution and it's developed, it can often be diluted or eroded at later stages. So I think we need a, a clearer line of sight for nature-based solutions from investment planning all the way through to delivery and operation and maintenance of, of, of infrastructure. I think there's a lack of urgency within policymakers and, uh, and there could be conflict, conflict and inconsistency between national and local policy. Um, this results in a lack of financial incentives and continued support for fossil fuels, for example. So as we've heard, we need more policy support mechanisms, such as cost sharing or tax incentive. Um, but also the policy focus often is focused towards um, offsetting rather than finding actual solutions, nature solutions. I think the planning system needs updating to improve sort of spatial planning requirements, both to make space for nature uh, and avoid the negative impacts on, on connected eastern ecosystems around, around development. So there's, um, there's not a thought about actual habitats and their variations and the biodiversity those habitats actually support. Um, think about engineering, it's actually conservative engineering and design practices, I think, are resulting in, in low adoption so far of natural solutions and continued use of hard engineering. So I think we need more training and education as, as, as engineers uh, are developed in specialist fields. Uh, around biodiversity and natural solutions. Um, a third challenge is we're not building in a strong enough business case to implement natural solutions. So we need to embed natural capital really early, early within investment decision making. So we can use total value frameworks to value natural capital and ecosystem services, which builds a stronger emphasis of sustainability within this investment decision making. Um, so qualitative measures for biodiversity are often discounted uh, within the weighting system of many decision-making tools and therefore get, get ignored. Um, a key issue is, is who's responsible is it to pay for these things. So project sponsors see the benefits are going to accrue to others in the wider community. So there's a challenge to how to capture this wider benefit in the overall business case. And, and citizens perhaps see the responsibility as government's responsibility and the lack of awareness for, for, for charging extra costs for these services. And, and just to wrap up, the final challenge is... Um, is there frequent need for trade-offs? So these could be trade-offs between uh, benefits and risks. So people value benefits in different ways. You need to find a consensus and show an inclusive approach to demonstrate a transparent negotiation of the trade-offs and that safeguards are in place. Um, I think there's also a trade-off between short-term and long-term benefits. So complex dynamic systems, um, well, they need a long-term monitoring flexibility. Uh, and this long-term approach doesn't often match with short-term political decision-making for governments and mayors or for budgetary timeframes for, for corporates investment planning. So I think we need to take a, an adaptive approach and to manage uncertainty and work with nature uh, uh, um, over the long term. Thank you very much, Stephen. And I think you know that you made a very valid point there that a lot of recovery and stimulus plans uh, now actually are giving out fossil fuel subsidies. So why not give that to nature, right? Um, I think that that's something that we really need to look into. Um, we'll come back to some of your points um, later. I'm just gonna go to Zoe now and like to invite Zoe. Can you please um, you know, tell us a little bit more about HSBC's new partnership on natural capital? And also what were some of your top three learnings and obstacles for investing in nature-based solutions. Excellent, thank you, Jessica, and to the World Economic Forum uh, for inviting me to contribute to this discussion. 
So yes, you're right. We've recently announced a joint venture with our asset management business and a climate change strategy organization, Pollination. Now, Pollination was founded about a year ago uh, by some, some people that have been working in the climate space for, for a long time now. And the real purpose is to try and unleash capital for nature-based solutions. So as a reminder for everyone, of course, reducing emissions isn't going to be enough on its own to get us to that one and a half degree world that we're trying to limit temperature rises to. And so far, the finance industry has been concentrating on scalable solutions. So looking at the growth of products in relation to green activities, so green bonds, green lending, etc. But now what we're seeing is an increasing appetite for both institutional investors and corporates to try and find access to nature-based solutions with the idea of being able to offset those residual emissions that they can't um, they can't eliminate through, for example, uh, getting them out of the supply chain or reducing them in their operations. So really, we're trying to address the need for scaling capital into this market. The aim, as I said, is to get to a six billion fund. We're starting with a one billion aim and it's targeted at institutional investors and corporates. And we're looking at six areas uh, to identify opportunities. Firstly, forestry, which is the obvious one. Um, agriculture, so sustainable land management. Clearly land use change in forestry is, is the biggest area of emissions after the energy system. We're looking at water, water management, blue carbon within oceans uh, and nature-based biofuels. But the critical point of the fund is that it's not just about raising capital, it's about the importance of stewardship. And one of the learnings that we, are, um, that we have taken so far, and bearing in mind this is a very fast paced and new initiative, is the appetite for education around understanding how nature really can play a role in um, providing that planetary balance that we're so looking for in terms of addressing climate change. In terms of the, 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 the learnings, really there are two things to take away. One is that the credibility of the project is of course of, of critical importance. And one of the ways to help with that for corporates and, and other investors that are looking to get access to, to this market is, is through scaling up expertise and knowledge and standards around impact. And that's building on one of the points that Virginie made about um, P&G. It's, it's understanding the impact of, of how nature can really help us solve climate problems. And then the second thing is also about uh, reporting principles and standards. Again, a common theme about how we really need to gain credibility and trust in this market. We need to have a consistency across being able to compare the various, uh, the various types of projects that will come up. So just to give a little bit of context, the voluntary market for carbon off offsets is only 0.6 billion at the moment. And that's less than 1% of the uh, compliance mechanism. So there's a massive opportunity here as both individuals and corporates are moving towards making that net zero pledge. In terms of the barriers, it's really the scale of the opportunity. And again, this comes back to the point of understanding impact. So for example, if you're a large Fortune 500 company that's wanting to address emissions in the supply chain, there's plenty of room to invest in projects because of a, a high level of cash availability in, for instance, ASEAN markets, which might be part of the supply chain for those, those companies and industries. The problem is there's not a good understanding as yet about true impact of nature-based solutions and therefore where to divert capital to first. So which is gonna be the, the area to protect the most that is going to have the largest um, impact on saving, saving the planet, but also in reducing emissions. So it, is it really forestry or is it an ocean-based solution or is it a land-based solution? Investors aren't really sure where to look on that. 
The second point in terms of barriers, liquidity of the market. We really need a global market that offers um, liquidity between both the voluntary mechanism and the compliance mechanism. And of course that would help with pricing. And then the third point is transparency around the risks uh, and, and, and the greenness uh, of the projects themselves. And then lastly, risk sharing uh, and insurance mechanisms. I think we, are, uh, we need to overcome the barrier of, of, of credibility and doing that means really understanding what the unintended risks are of protecting one particular element of nature versus, versus another. And so that impact curve, if we can work closely with scientists to develop an impact curve of, of, of what to do first, and what to, where the scale of capital is needed, we can allocate funding to those projects accordingly. So that's a few thoughts on the project. Um, I'll leave it there and I'm sure there'll be plenty of room for questions. Thank you so much, Zoe, and for building on some of the points that were raised. I think they were super relevant and some food for thought, which we'll come back to. Um, right now, we're, we're going to introduce a video that's been specially prepared by the Minister Ricardo Lozano of uh, the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Colombia, who will not join us today because of the time zone difference. I think it's 2 or 3 in the a.m. Uh, for him. So we're going to play this video and let's hear from him now. Federal Minister of Climate Change and advisor of the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Mr. Steve Loyal, Lead Sustainable Investment Advisory, Aru Group. Soy Knight Group Head, HSBC, Center of Sustainable Finance. Virgin Elias, Chief Sustainability Officer in Procter and Gamble International Operations. Banguhi Norohe, Community Champion, Nairobi Hub. Never before, the relationship between health and environment has been so clear. Therefore, we see 2020 as an opportunity to promote nature as the central axis of sustainable development, investing in healthy ecosystem and nature-based solution is the best strategy to move forward towards to green and resilient recovery. Colombia's strategy policy to address the impact of the COVID-19 has an approach based on linking of ecosystem health with the well-being of current and future generations. Deforestation reduction restoration and reforestation, agroforestry payment for environment services, ecotourism, clean energy and green public spaces are some example of the nature-based solution that without no doubt should be part of our economic recovery. Nature-based solution provides an opportunity to integrate climate and biodiversity and SDGs agendas under a coherent approach to solve social challenges. Colombia's portfolio of the nature-based solution amounts to 365 projects, of uh, which 47% of these projects are related to agriculture and forestry sectors. 13 percent to tourism sector and 12 percent to food sector. Other projects are related to the circular economy, power generation, art, artisan products and among others. Our government aim is to achieve a green and sustainable economy recovery to improve the quality of life of our population through the sustainable use of natural capital and social inclusion as main elements of this recovery. We are already undertaking important steps. Under the initiative, by planting we are brought together, we will plant 180 million trees to restore 300,000 hectares by 2022. 
for a greener country by generating approximately 50,800 jobs. We seek to conserve 160,000 hectares while generating income for 13 families through the payment for ecosystem services. The estimated investment is uh, approximately $38 million for two years. In these two years, we have seen constant trend towards a reduction of deforestation. And by 2019, we achieved a reduction of almost 20% compared to the previous year. In order to strengthen cross-sectoral management to reduce deforestation and as a part of our country's involvement in the Tropical Forest Alliance 2020, several deforestation agreements have been signed with the chain supplies such as meat, dairy, palm oil, wood and cocoa. Colombia promotes the Leticia Pact adaptation among Amazonian countries last year to reaffirm our commitment with the pro protection of the Amazon and our communities we who inhabit it. We are working on developing biodiversity cities in which citizens conserve natural capital to increase urban sustainability and circular economy, but also to promote connectivity between cities and rural centers. In all these efforts, we need to work closely with the private sector as a partner in the transition to sustainable partners of production and consumption and to invest in several opportunities that nature brings us to make our economies thrive. We are still in time to take the right path. The 2020 years should be seen as the year in which governments, the private sector, the civil society and other stakeholders get together to follow a green and resilient recovery, which prioritizes education, participation, innovation, research, financing, adaptation and mitigation as its most important strategic lines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, for that wonderful insight. And it's great to see how even more governments are really looking at nature-based solutions in their recovery plans. I understand that we have a few questions here from our audience today. I'd like to keep encouraging people to interact with each other and on the topic in our chat box. I'm going to call on them right now to ask their questions. Uh, would you please uh, keep your questions to under one minute and you know, feel free to bring in some fresh perspectives and also to pose a question to a specific person or to the entire panel. Um, I'd like to invite first uh, now Nina Jensen to ask a question. Thank you so much and thanks to all the great uh, speakers so far. Um, we talk a lot about protecting nature as a climate-based solution, but I think it's also important to remember that nature has to be protected for nature itself. And we often uh, turn to solutions like planting trees rather than actually protecting uh, the trees and land that is already there. My question is, um, what are the top three actions that business leaders, uh, including those of us listening now, should take to protect and restore nature, both for the sake of nature itself, but also to protect the climate? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. We're going to go to the next question and then we'll come back to the panel. I have the next question from Bharavi Jani. Yeah, thanks. Um... I have a question to the panelists in continuum to the point raised on involving communities in on-ground nature action agenda. And if there were any ideas and thoughts about what kind of um, frameworks uh, exist to provide financial support 
uh, either by public sector or private sector or multilateral institutions for those kind of collaborations on the ground and what would success look like uh, in that context? Thank you very much for that question. And last but not least, we have a question here from Donna Baratarelli. Yes, hello, hi. Um, it's not uh, really a question, it's really more um, a statement. Um, I think when we talk about climate and nature, I think we cannot ignore that we live on a blue planet and the role that the ocean has to play um, in trying to solve uh, some of our environmental and social and economic uh, problems. So I really think that awareness is key, as it was mentioned, we need to engage the communities in conservation, uh, but we also have to uh, think that we have to stop really losing what we have, restore what we have lost and really protect what we still have and that nature-based solutions can really help to do, to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna, for that. Those insights are very relevant. I'm going to come back to the panel and with an eye on the time, because the, the, Nina's question is totally spot on and it was a question that I was going to ask all of you to kind of close. So if I can invite you to give your thoughts, you know, what are the top three actions to protect nature, not just to restore? And also, can you give your thoughts on what are some of the frameworks for financial support that are out there? Um, perhaps I can uh, invite the minister to go first, Minister Amin. If you're there. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. And uh, thanks for a very uh, uh, interesting session. I was listening to all of it. It was very, very uh, enlightening. Um, uh, just a few things. I think uh, what is most important is uh, we talked about the standards uh, not being there right now. But uh, as you rightly pointed out, IUCN has, uh, has uh, launched nature-based standards. And I was uh, lucky to be there when that happened. I think that's going to be a critical and when we look at nature-based solutions uh, 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 going forward. What is also very important is that all the activities that we are doing uh, need to be uh, strongly impact driven and quantifiable. Uh, the credibility of these projects, which was also mentioned in one of uh, the, the remarks is, is absolutely essential if we are to start uh, looking at you know, uh, private sector and, 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 and hope that private sector would start investing in the nature-based solutions. Uh, as far as nature protection is concerned, uh, I mean, I can give you my own example that uh, for the billion tree project, almost 60% was assisted natural regeneration. So we were not planting new trees for the full billion tree uh, target, but 60% of it was just to protect nature and see it bounce back. And the bounce back was, was uh, you know, much beyond our own expectations. Uh, we had expected about, you know, a thousand uh, saplings to be regenerated in a in an acre, but it happened to be 2,500, which was uh, uh, which was actually uh, uh, happened. So it, it just shows that, that you know when you start protecting nature, the best way to do it is, is is to protect the natural surroundings that nature is in, and that that pays you back in the most efficient, cost efficient, and the most uh, 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 quick manner. So I think that that's really critical. Uh, I think uh, when we start looking at this, and uh, and a link to that, I think is the issue of valuation of nature. Uh, there has been a lot of work done on it, but still a lot more needs to be done, especially for the protected areas uh, that we have uh, assigned all over the world. There needs to be a valuation of the biodiversity that is, that is present over there. Uh, again, giving an example of Pakistan, you know, there's one national park in Pakistan, which is at 15,000 feet. Uh, it's a huge plateau, probably the biggest plateau in the world at that height. There is no other ecosystem like that in the world. So when you're talking about valuing that, that particular protected area, the, the economic value for protecting it uh, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of carbon sequestration, and in terms of you know, the, the few uh, 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 possibilities for, for nature within that ecosystem, which is, which is not available anywhere else, else in the world, needs to be clearly laid out. Uh, we, at the moment, do not know really how, how to get that uh, uh, issue done. But I think that's something which is critical when you start protecting nature. That, the true value of that nature uh, needs to be understood. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to go to Zoe now for the question on frameworks for financial support. Zoe, over to you very quickly. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to respond to the actions uh, very quickly and in terms of, of, of how to finance this. So in terms of the protection and restoring, businesses have got three ways that they can tackle this. One is addressing emissions in their operational activities. So purely around uh, power use, waste management, food supply, that kind of stuff, uh, and, and what they're actually doing to, to run the business itself. Second is whether or not the strategic business model is a high climate impact sector or a low climate impact one and how they address the emissions in that. And thirdly, what their moral responsibility and philanthropic objectives are. We've had most success on this where we've adopted approach that captures all of these elements to give a holistic view on addressing the climate. One, in terms of protection, we've used volunteering and community investment and philanthropy to target that angle, and that's brought a lot of employee engagement um, in, 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 into the, to the thinking. The, the uh, operational management has provided bigger funding to address bigger issues like um, renewable power and, and, and how to, to, to sort of protect areas around um, around energy and land use. And then finally, the sort of business model point is, is around thinking about how finance as a whole can provide the solutions, hence the asset management and uh, joint venture with pollination. Um, and I just am going to give us a quick plug, which is we, will, we won World's Best Bank for Sustainable Finance for the second year in a row recently. So I'm really excited to be a part of that. So thank you for the opportunity for the session. Thank you very much, Zoe. Going quickly to Virginia, like just to give us your top clear business actions where protecting nature is concerned. So I would say the best thing and the first thing that business needs to do to protect nature is to lower their emission that they control. You know? So uh, this is why our first goal is to um, cut our emission by, by 50% in the next decade. And then, you know, going to nature, as I echo what Zoe was saying in terms of we need to advance the science of impact measurement. And so I would not pretend to have the answers to, you know, what do we need to do, you know, to protect uh, nature. This is why we are partnering with a great organization like Conservation International and WWF, because we need to understand, you know, where we need to go to have the greatest impact, where we need to go in priority. Uh, to have the greatest benefit uh, in terms of in terms of carbon. So this is something that will take time. I mean, we need to develop over the next ten years a portfolio of of solution, and we will prioritize the one uh, that can have the greatest impact. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And going to Stephen very quickly, you know, as an urban planner, there's so many people being added to cities all the time. How do we keep nature-based solutions right at the top? Uh, thanks, Jessica. Well, I think the, the key action I'd like to take away is one that we can all adopt. And it's, sort of, it's thinking about, are we thinking about natural solutions and wider capitals in every decision we make? So how do we how do we actually sort of um, think about nature and biodiversity and how do we take a sort of capital approach in every investment decision? So it shouldn't be possible for us to make a decision if we're not actually um, making a, a rigorous assessment of what the natural risks and opportunities are. And are we properly quantifying that? And are we using the frameworks that are out there? The best practice is evolving and it is available to us. So if we can't hand on heart and say we've made a business decision taking full of account of nature, then we've, we've not really, you know, we've just not done, we're not, we're not, not been good enough. You know, we're not, we're not um, addressing the problem. So it's it, every investment decision really needs a rigorous assessment of, of natural capital and biodiversity opportunities and challenges. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen. And going last but not least to Wanjuhi, as the youngest person on this panel, what, what gives you hope when you think about nature-based solutions? Um, I mean, seeing young people truly involved in um, restoration and, and conservation pro projects. Um, I'm happy when I think about the Global Shapers community, which I belong in. Um, we are all volunteers, but we are devoted to uh, de mitigating against the adverse effects of, of climate change. But allow me to also quickly mention that uh, businesses must hold governments accountable. You find that these are the, con the key contributors of taxes in, uh, for governments um, and countries. And so they 
have direct lines to government and they can hold government accountable and say, we want stronger policies. And this happened in Kenya after the, the Civil Forest KE. My, my greatest allies were the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. Um, secondly, our biggest financier has been the, the private sector through the CSR, but we are changing our model, seeing that they cannot, we cannot continue receiving CSR yet. These companies are the biggest uh, contributors to, to, for instance, PET bottles, and yet they are giving us money for CSR, but then their products are harming the, the environment. So we need to rethink, we are rethinking our model and we have a stakeholders meeting uh, in the next two weeks because we have two of our biggest uh, restoration projects. We have an 850 hectares forest and a 150 hectares forest. And we're bringing all stakeholders to, together to see how can we uh, raise resources, raise money uh, from people who are truly prioritizing people and planet without working with corporates that are uh, contributing to harming the same environment they claim to be solving uh, uh, problems for. Wonderful one, Johi, and that is a really, really good note to end this session on. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, even though I know there were many comments as well as questions coming in. I'm sorry we could not take all of them. Just as a very short summary, I'm going to come back to the, the quote that I started with, which is there are no jobs on the dead planet. And I think, you know, many people think of nature-based solutions as just nature-related or environment-related, but this is an absolute economic issue. So I hope that we can take these learnings into our work and uh, our, our professions and also to think about how we can really embed nature into building back better for a resilient future. I'd like to once again thank all our speakers today and the World Economic Forum for organizing this much needed conversation. Um, there's going to be a survey that's going to be uh, launched for everyone and also a rapid fire networking for those that you can, can stay on for just 15 minutes. So thank you everyone for your participation. I hope to see you all at the networking. Thank you so much speakers.